Thank you all for coming today. Um, welcome everyone. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm Claire from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm the coordinator of our Tackling Plastic MI project. And that is a project funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. So this is the first in our short series of Tackling Plastic webinars for Eco Schools MI, which is run by Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. And I'm delighted to have Lizzie Daly with us here today. Um, many of you will know her already. And um, she also was a speaker at our Eco Schools Conference last year. And for those of you who don't, Lizzie is a wildlife biologist, TV presenter, filmmaker, and um, explorer. And she's with us today to share her experiences and insights from around the world and how wildlife has been impacted um, by our misuse of plastic. So we'll be deep diving into plastics and the marine life, as well as looking at a bit closer to home and the impacts of plastic in and around where we live. And hopefully you'll, be, you'll be help you take action to stop plastics getting where they shouldn't be. So by the end of the webinar today, we hope you'll feel really even more empowered to take eco action and reduce your use of pointless plastic at home while you're being homeschooled and then bring on what you've learned into the classroom and take it back there and put it into practice there. So before I hand over to Lizzie, um, I just want to introduce you to my colleague and co-host Claire. Claire, would you like to say a few words? Hello folks, I'm Claire Leonard. I'm the Tackling Plastics Communications Officer. So I'll be assisting Claire and Lizzie today by monitoring the chat. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We'll be asking for your questions throughout this webinar. So if you'd like to type in your questions as we go in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the webinar, and we'll be able to get them through to Lizzie for you on your behalf. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. Lizzie, over to you. So hello everyone, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, our fantastic marine environments, the marine species that are in our environments, and the issue of plastic, which I'm sure you all know of. You've all been connected to the issue of plastic in some kind of way. Um, and we're going to be showing you, um, or I'm going to be showing you some of my favourite clips and some of my favourite photos and bringing you along on a bit of a journey to meet some of the species that I have met in my career in these environments and how plastic is affecting them. So hopefully if I share this with you now, you will be able to see my presentation. So... <laughs> I'm going to reintroduce myself just a little bit and tell you a little bit more about, about who I am and, and my background. And then we're going to go, as I say, on this journey. First, I'd like to show you um, some species that I've met, but then I'd like to go into actually what is plastics? What are the different types of plastics uh, that, that you can find and that you see not only in your, perhaps in your garden or around your local area, but in the oceans as well? Um, I'm just going to turn on a my chat here just a second um here we go more chat there we are okay so here we are fabulous so if this all works this is me um i am a biologist first and foremost i love everything about nature i've always had a massive fascination um with the natural world and with the animals within it and i'm hoping that you do too let me know in the chat if you are inspired by nature in that same way and if so what are your favorite animals what are your favorite marine species did you know that yesterday was World Ocean Day? A fantastic day and a reminder of how incredible our oceans really are. It was just a kind of a day to celebrate all the wonderful species that we know and love, like this hammerhead shark that I was filming in the Bahamas last year. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact of plastics on animals like hammerhead sharks. But I've always had a love for nature. And so being a scientist is an absolute dream of mine. However, living by the ocean has just meant that I've spent a lot of time in the ocean. It's how I um, learn more about the species that are, that are in these environments and connect with it. Because I'm not primarily a marine biologist, but I do love nature. <laughs> 
So um, I'm actually currently studying a PhD looking at elephants, elephant movements and human and elephant conflict, um, and also slightly touching on penguins as well and penguin movements. Not linked, <laughs> but both equally important to understand changing environments uh, and changing landscapes. And then on top of that, I do a lot of TV work. So I'm very lucky to, um, to, to be a TV presenter. And I absolutely just love being able to connect wider audiences to these environments, these places that I get to go to. And just before lockdown hit, um, I was actually, oh, I was actually here. I was actually in Antarctica. It's my first time in Antarctica. I was there in February um, and I was there for a month. We actually sailed from South America over to the Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and then down to the Antarctic Peninsula. A fantastic, incredible place uh, to be. So yeah, it was really brilliant. And I even got to um, meet some of these. This is a Gen 2 penguin, very curious uh, at this time of year, which was at the beginning of March, the end of their summer season. Season, um, where these penguins they're really full the parents have done their duties filling up and and rearing these chicks ready to fledge uh, before the end of the summer season and so they're a little bit curious and sometimes they come over <laughs> to say hello so we'll be talking about some of the animals I met in Antarctica and why that's important in this conversation of plastic and I'd also like to quickly talk about what's happening now because we're all having to adapt. I'm talking to you through a laptop and it's an absolute pleasure, but normally I'd be chatting to you face to face in a classroom and having this conversation face to face. But because of lockdown, we are getting creative and we are all adapting. So um, myself and uh, the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales and the Skoma Island team, it's an island off of Wales in the south south coast of Wales off of a place called Pembrokeshire. We're running an online series called Skoma Live. It's to celebrate the marine species off of our coasts and we're doing it through a Facebook Live. So uh, we're bringing live puffins, which I'm gonna be sharing with you today, which is really, really exciting. We have got live puffin cam to bring to you very shortly. <laughs> um, and also we're talking about the other important stories as well with dolphins that we get off of the coast of Wales. Um, we'll be talking about porpoise, seabirds, the lot. So I'll be talking about that shortly, but make sure you check out um, Skoma Live as well. So let's talk about our planet, this beautiful blue planet, which it absolutely is. Um, there's some really big facts out there about our oceans and about um, our, our blue planet, if you like. It's called the blue marble because such a large amount of the Earth's surface is covered in ocean, 70% in fact. And to think that most life on Earth is actually in the ocean. <laughs> There's still so much we haven't explored. We've only explored about 5% of the ocean, which is just still a crazy fact. I mean, have, have a, let me know in the comments if you have actually um, heard that fact before. And it's this mystery about the ocean, which is just still so inspiring to think we still have so much to explore. And of course, within the ocean, there's huge, huge um, marine habitats of different varieties. The Great Barrier Reef, the largest living structure, about 2,500 kilometers wide. It can be seen from space. And within the ocean, we have lots and lots of different species from fish to some of the more charismatic species like our whales, which we'll be talking about today. And even the fantastic small ones, which you may not even think about, the crustaceans, the crabs, the sea slugs, the nudibranchs. So let me know what your favourite marine species is, please. I want to hear it. I think my favourite is probably the humpback whale. Quite iconic, very charismatic, but they're a fantastic animal that I've been very lucky to meet across the world. So we are very lucky to have the ocean. On top of that, we have lots of species within it that move into different areas. So you may have heard of different oceans and different seas, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Irish Sea, Red Sea, and species of different uh, groups um, move and migrate over big distances. So you may have heard migration before, and migration is basically the seasonal movement of an animal from one place to another. Let me give you an example. So um, if you were sat at, if you've got two windows in your house right now, you're sat at home in lockdown, you want to see some birds, and you're at one window, which at the beginning of spring uh, has a tree kind of covering it, but without any leaves. So as your spring goes on and you're looking out for birds and you're seeing what garden wildlife you can see from your window, those leaves start to grow over that window. 
well, now you're not able to do what you want to do, right? So you have to move somewhere else. So it's essentially the same in the natural and marine environment. If there is, is a resource or perhaps they, they move for food or it's a better habitat, the environment, perhaps it's to mate, these animals migrate over different distances across oceans um, for that particular reason. So oceans are all connected across the planet and this is why we all need to care for our oceans and a lot of us as humans rely on the ocean. In fact, do this with me. Ready? We're going to have a breathe in and a breathe out. Okay, everybody. So breathe in. And again. Fifty percent of the air that we breathe is from the ocean. It's actually a little bit more than that. It's probably more like seventy percent. But the ocean provides so much oxygen for us to breathe. We rely on it. So we rely on the ocean, and the ocean depends on us to keep it protected and safe from things like plastic. Now, um, I want to quickly talk about these. You may have heard of plankton before. They're tiny microscopic organisms that can be found in the ocean. Some plankton blooms, which are basically huge congregations of this plankton in one area, are so big that they also can be seen from space. And there's millions and millions of them. And there's hundreds or thousands of species of plankton or phytoplankton, zooplankton you may have heard of as well. And they all have a really critical role because they form the basis of the food chain for so many species on our planet. And they also provide oxygen, but as a food source, they are hugely vital for species like whales, for mobular rays. You may have seen some really fantastic clips of rays chasing down uh, in this kind of fluorescent light. Well, actually that is plankton that's producing its own light in a chemical reaction with this chemical called luciferin, believe it or not, um, and it produces this light. But this plankton is a main food source for those mobular rays and for so many big species, big and small. And of course, our ocean, our plankton I mentioned, is so responsible for providing oxygen for us to breathe, but so many other habitats are too, like sea grasses and seaweed. You think maybe sea grass and seaweed is a little bit slimy, <laughs> but it is really, really important. And as I said, provides more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. So we have to protect it. We absolutely do. Now, there are a variety of marine habitats and one of my favorite places, oh, we've got some comments coming in. Let me just actually see what you guys are saying. Um, orcas, dolphins, sea turtles, fish, manta rays. Yes. Okay. I'm loving this a lot. Um, favorite land, what's my favorite land animal? I will come to the questions at the end and we can talk about that in detail. Basking sharks. Yes. Great one. Uh, Gillian says Megalodon. Wow. Okay. Now that is a good shout. <laughs> Great white shark we've got on here. Oh, dolphins rule. Yes, they do. And we are so lucky to have them off of the UK coast as well. Um, so there's a place that I have absolutely um, fallen in love with. It's a place called Bay of Biscay. Um, it's off of France and Spain, and it's a really interesting place uh, for cetaceans, this group of dolphins, whales, and porpoise. And within this Bay of Biscay, there is a big drop. Um, it's a, basically a huge shelf that runs right through it, which means that the water level drops from just a few hundred meters to a few thousand meters. And in this Bay of Biscay is where you can find a huge range, in fact, a quarter of the world's cetaceans have been spotted at some point in this area and I think it just goes to show how even you know we talk about the ocean and you may think in your head well it's so vast it's just one big place but no there's so many different habitats within the ocean that we should be protecting in different ways and we're all linked to that you know coastal habitat may have different species fish food source which will support seabirds and dolphins compared to right out there in the Bay of Biscay where you get that huge drop in that shelf and you have you know much more deep diving animals like your sperm whale which is one of the most if not the most deep diving whale that we have along with beaked whales as well which can be found in this part of Bay of Biscay and sperm whales feed on can anyone tell me what sperm whales feed on write it in the comments I want to see um, so yes, I've got a note saying my sound's not great. So I'm hoping if I turn this up, I will. Hopefully you can hear me, let me know. Um, but yeah, one of my favorite places. And it's exciting to talk to you because you and I are actually connected. So I'm down here right now in Cardiff. Um, I spend a lot of time out on the coast here in Pembrokeshire. And 
in between you and I, you lovely people up in Northern Ireland, um, is a fantastic stretch of sea called the Irish Sea. And here you can find a lot of life. Some you have already mentioned, you know, basking sharks I've seen off of the coast of Wales, porpoise, dolphins. And actually, a little birdie tells me that recently you have even had orca off of your coast. Am I right? Well, we've got a few um a few answers coming in is it squid yes sperm whales uh, go that deep they dive um 3, feet below the surface of the ocean to eat squid absolutely spot on so you've had um a few members of the western community pod of orca that are known to travel around the british isles coming off of your coast which is so exciting and um, this orca in particular is, is called john co you can see that notch in its dorsal fin there which is just makes it very distinctive um and an incredible orca but how incredible just goes to show how how rich our waters are around the uk and we're all all connected now unfortunately plastic impacts all of our wildlife in lots of different ways. Um, so I thought I would share with you some of the species that I've met throughout my career so far and talk about some of those impacts as well. So let me know in the comments, which animal would you like to go visit first? Now, while you let me know in the comments, um, and we can kind of go through this, whatever you want to go to first, we will do just that. You are, the power is in your hands. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got, oh, we've got dolphins, we've got puffins. So we've got, I should actually say, this is a humpback whale um, fluke. So we can talk about whales, we can talk about our pinnipeds, so our seals, we can talk about our seabirds, our puffins, or turtles. Let me know what you think. Okay, we've got a few answers coming through. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, two different ways really that plastic, um, main different ways that plastic can impact our marine life. So one being entanglement and the other being ingestion, mistaking plastic uh, for food and actually that plastic ending up inside that uh, animal's body. Okay, we've got loads of people commenting here, dolphin, puffin, seals, sea turtles, Oh, that's your favorite. Oh yeah, seals, 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 puffins, turtles, whales, puffins, seals. This isn't helping. <laughs> I see seals, so we're going to go for seals, okay? Um, I hope that's all right with everyone. I promise you we'll go to them all. <laughs> um, here we go. If this will work. There we go. Um, so, oh gosh, we are very lucky here in the UK. Uh, we have the common seal, um, also known as the harbour seal, or the grey seal. And the grey seal I've spent a lot of time with in the water here. Here in the UK, we have about 40% of the world's population of grey seals. And they're so curious. They're a fantastic species. Um, they are what's called a true seal. So if you think about our seal groups, some like our sea lions um, are called eared seals. And then we have groups like our grey seal, which are called true seals. And one of the ways you can tell the difference is by looking at their ears, funnily enough. So I have a clip that I'm hoping you can see. This is uh, off of um, the coast of England where I, I was so lucky to swim with these curious grey seals. And you can see how curious they are. They don't have hands like you and I. They can't pick up a glass of water, for example, like this. So instead, they use their mouths to explore. So you saw that uh, exploration with its mouth on my, on my fins there. Um, and they're a wonderful, wonderful species but unfortunately because they don't have hands like us they're not able to you know take take their scarves off if seals wore scarves <laughs> at this in the same way they're not able to take plastic that gets caught around their necks if they get caught in netting um, so this is often a sight that you may see especially with young pups as well and it's it's a really sad sight um, but luckily for us there's lots of teams around all of our coasts um, and I'm sure Northern Ireland too that work hard to make sure they keep on top of this entanglement and to make sure that our, our seals that do get stuck in this entanglement then get um, hopefully uh, released and get that kind of netting cut. So if you do ever see a seal entangled in any type of uh, netting or fishing line then do make sure you contact the right people and fingers crossed they can help that little fur, um, that little seal pup out. I talk about fur seals because I've just been to Antarctica and there's a number of uh, seal species or pinnipeds that you can see, this group of seals and sea lions that you can see um, uh, in Antarctica, one of which is this. 
this is one of my, it was one of my go-to animals to see because they have quite a reputation as a bit of a predator. Now, a large part of their diet is actually krill, which I'll talk about momentarily. But at this time of year, when you start to get these penguins that are just at their later stages of, um, of fledging, so they're almost ready to, to, to leave, they're full of food, they're, they're fully grown chicks, they've got rid of those downy feathers, they're ready to leave, and waiting in the waters are one of these. Does anyone know what this is? Can anyone let me know what they think this fantastic animal is? And it's just a, a really great one. Here's a clip of one in the water. I'm hoping you can hear this. Let me know if you can. So this is our boat. This is the boat that we were in. And this is, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm too excited. <laughs> this is a leopard seal. And these seals are absolutely enormous. And again, you see that curiosity come in with their huge, huge mouths. They have this really big jaw, leopard seals. And if you actually look at their teeth, you can see how they are adapted for eating krill for most of their lives because they have these what's called tricuspid teeth. It's basically a tooth with a three notches to help filter out krill from water, which uh, most people think, oh gosh, they're big predators, they eat penguins most of the time, but actually they don't. It's krill that makes up a large part of their diet. And scientists now are even suggesting that perhaps tiny, tiny fragments of plastic can even be found in krill. So plastic is getting everywhere, even in extreme regions uh, like Antarctica, but what an animal. And um, talking about uh, entanglement and, and marine litter, um, We've already met this fantastic hammerhead shark and I've spent lots of time with sharks um, uh, out in Bahamas when I was there. We swam with uh, Caribbean reef sharks, hammerhead sharks, a glimpse of a tiger shark, just an incredible experience. But one of the things I noticed was the hooks in the faces of these sharks. And that's often, we see that across the board with a lot of our bigger marine life, is they get hooks stuck in their mouths, perhaps if they go to, to feed on, um, on bait that's been left over by fishermen. So that's a really big issue. And someone out in the Bahamas is addressing this directly. Her name's Christina Zanato. You may know her as the shark whisperer. She's a fantastic female conservationist, and she's dedicated the last 20 years of her life removing the hooks from these Caribbean reef sharks' faces to try and help with the issue of marine litter. How are we doing on time? Whoa, I have so much to show you. I need to hurry up. <laughs> so this is Christina. Um, just an incredible experience. I'm loving some of you. Hammerhead, so cute. Yes, brilliant. Um, we've got I Love Sharks from Matthew. Matthew, I Love Sharks as well. Great guesses with leopard seals there. A few of you getting that right. Yes, so um, we see marine litter entanglement as an issue with species. Right, let's move on to the next one. Let me know what you would like next. We need a bit of a, a music in between this, don't we, to kind of get us going for the next animal. Anyone want to tell me what they'd like to see next? Um, we can have puffins live. We can quickly see a video of a humpback whale. We've got turtles, we've got turtles, we're going to turtles. Here we go. So I'm actually going to. Dun 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 dun. dun. Here we go, turtles. So, um, <laughs> so this is a turtle, and uh, <laughs> um, across our oceans, I, again, I've been very lucky to actually see t uh, green turtles in Oman and nesting on the beach. It's incre incredible species. But um, does anyone know where the largest turtle ever found was found? It is in the UK. I'll give you that clue. Let me know in the comments, and I'll explain to you uh, what happened. Because in 1988, this gentleman here. Just on my left, I'm hoping your left too, maybe you're right, this gentleman here, um, he, uh, he's called Mike Alexander and he got a call uh, in 1988 about what looked like a huge car washing up onto the beach. And it was this turtle. This turtle's predicted to be roughly 100 years old. It was almost 1,000 kilograms in weight. It's an enormous turtle. It's the largest one ever to wash up. So any guesses on where it washed up? Um, and unfortunately, even back in 1988, this turtle actually was found on this beach because it was found to have ingested plastic. So a large part of the turtle's diet um, is, does anyone want to guess? I'm testing you guys. UK, yes it was in UK, the leatherback turtle washed up, but where? Where? Devon, good guess. We do get lots of wash-ups on the southwest coast, and that's largely to do with the Gulf Stream, um, which carries in a lot of um, unusual wash-ups. 
Jellyfish, yes, okay. Jellyfish, yes, they do eat a lot of jellyfish. It wasn't in Scotland, it was in Wales. Yes, well done, Kay. <laughs> um, it was in Wales, it was in North Wales in a place called Harlech, so a few hours uh, north from here. Unfortunately, yes, it, it did wash up and it was because of plastic. Um, and it's now in a museum and it's used for education. An incredible turtle um, that washed up here, but perhaps something that you think is a little bit unusual. Now, the reason why um, plastic bags are an issue, because they look very similar to jellyfish if they're just wafting along in the ocean. And on the right here, this kind of gruesome picture is of the inside of a leatherback turtle's mouth. And they have these barbs which are almost inward facing. And this really helps a jellyfish to eat. When a jellyfish, uh, a jellyfish, sorry, a turtle to eat. So when a turtle actually eats that jellyfish um, and is ripping it apart, and they eat a lot because these jellyfish contain so much water, they need lots and lots of them um, for enough nutrients um, in their diet. And they need to rip that jellyfish apart so that it needs to stay in their mouth essentially and that's what these barbs are for so once they ingest a plastic bag um, it kind of sits there it's not able to then leave their stomachs and unfortunately that makes their turtle feel uh, full and is a really really big problem yes it's not it's not too nice um so yeah so as i said that that turtle is now in the museum mike alexander is a fantastic conservationist um, and i myself have seen wash-ups off of wales in fact i know that you in northern ireland had a wash-up of a loggerhead turtle as well um again be brought in because of that gulf stream but you guys Whoever dealt with that loggerhead turtle um, did some really fantastic uh, recovery program and it survives. So that's fantastic. Unfortunately, this Kempt Ridley turtle, which is a, a critically endangered species that washed off of Wales, I got a call about it off of the uh, south coast of Wales, um, didn't make it. So we still don't know the cause of death as of yet, but we do get wash ups of turtles here in, in Britain quite, not quite regularly, but um, you know, it's not completely rare. Now, I talk about jellyfish, and um, one of my other favourite animals, or I should say organisms, are jellyfish. They are fantastic. And um, I had this encounter last year with a giant barrel jellyfish off of the coast of Cornwall. Let me know if you have seen uh, this footage or a picture. I should actually show you this picture that I've got here. Dun, 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 dun. This is me diving with this exact barrel jellyfish. So in these summer months, Right now we're getting warmer waters in our coastal waters, which brings in a lot of that plankton I was talking about, which brings in uh, a lot of these, a lot of jellyfish, which then goes up of that, um, up that food chain and um, brings in turtles as well. So um, it does look like a mushroom, it absolutely does. So this is the picture that I just showed you and um, it goes to show how diverse, how incredible our oceans are, but they're all connected. You're starting to see these connections between plankton and jellyfish and turtles and how plastic intertwines with every stage um, of that food chain and of that ecosystem. Also, just to note, I know we're all in lockdown currently, um, but perhaps for next year or maybe later in the summer, depending on where you live, maybe you're near a beach, do go out and have a look um, and get involved with your own citizen science project. Um, the Great British Jelly Watch weekend we set up to help understand how many jellyfish we have in the UK and where they wash up. So you can go online, find, find that uh, citizen science project and tell us what species you've seen washing up on the beaches, which will genuinely help scientists at Swansea University with their research to understand how um, jellyfish numbers are changing across uh, Britain, Northern Ireland, etc. So, I also, um, just a very quick one, I've mentioned it already, but plastics and chemicals have already um, been starting to be seen more and more in these regions of Antarctica and South Georgia. And um, these animals, penguins in particular, spend such a large amount of time out in the ocean outside of this breeding season. They, you know, they're only on land for those few months that they are there to breed. And this is a picture I took. Can you believe it? Look at this. This is king penguins in South Georgia. This is a colony of 250,000 of them. Their numbers are doing really, really well. And I think largely that's due to such a, an available food resource in these waters. It's an incredible place. But you can imagine what happens when you, you may get an increase in plastic, larger parts of plastic, which then get broken down which then get consumed by smaller species like fish enter the bodies of those fish and then get eaten by penguins taken back to those chicks that can prove really really damaging yeah that is a lot of penguins um eleanor says we have lots of moon jellyfish where we live absolutely 
Wonderful, that is fantastic. You may also see comb jellyfish, which are smaller ones as well, which is just brilliant. Okay, we've been to see seals, we've been to see turtles. Um, let's go for, what should we go for? Oh, I'm afraid, Leslie, I don't have anything on polar bears. I'm so sorry, um, um, but polar bears are brilliant. Um, we're gonna to go to puffins. Yeah, you guys are asking puffins, so we're going for puffins. So I mentioned Skoma Live, um, and uh, Skoma Island is a particularly good place for puffins. If I'm not mistaken, there's a lovely island in Northern Ireland that is home to penguins. Uh, penguins? <laughs> home to puffins and gannets and, and lots of other um, kitty wakes as well, lots of fantastic seabirds. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, our, our seabirds that do go out and fish Puffins eat largely sand eels um, and smaller fish, like small herring. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes they mistake small, tiny bits of, um, of plastic for food as well, and they end up ingesting those. They're quite a small bird, puffins. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, now especially as they're bringing back that food for their pufflings, it isn't uncommon for them to feed their, their young tiny, tiny, tiny bits of plastic. And um, some of the other species of penguin, tufted penguins and horned penguins that you get um, towards Alaska way, have been found to have ingested tiny bits of, of plastic. So the impact of this is of course that build up in their stomach um, and over time they end up feeling full, which can eventually uh, be fatal for a small, lovely bird. I'm sure you can all agree that puffins are fantastic. Ravelin Island, that's exactly what, what I was thinking. Thank you. Um, brilliant, yeah, brilliant, definitely. Um, you know, make sure that next season you head out and come and see these beautiful birds. But for now, should we have a look at some live puffins? Let's have a look. This is a live puff cam that's been set up on Soma Island. And we've managed to embed the video just for you guys here. Now, about half an hour ago, there were a lot more puffins. <laughs> um, there are still plenty there, actually. Um, so, yeah, so as you can see this is a place called the wick it's one of the best places to see these puffins on the island and right now the main thing that we will be looking for is this being back of sand eels and monitoring of um perhaps they'll be bringing back materials as well you can see in the in the landscape just on this massive hill here there's lots of poles and these puffins actually live in these burrows where right now there's already been confirmed there are puffins on the island. And one of the things you'll see as these puffins move around is they'll often be cleaning out their burrows. They're very clean and they'll be bringing back small bits of nest materials. Sometimes they do have bits of plastic in their mouths and sometimes that's the case as well when they're coming back, um, unfortunately, with their food. But how incredible are they? And you can watch this all day long, as I do, um, <laughs> all the time. And um, I've got a few um, comments saying that I'm breaking up. So I'm very sorry if I am. Um, I will keep going for now and hopefully when you watch back later, if you've lost me, it'll be a bit clearer. Um, so yeah, so brilliant. Absolutely love them. But unfortunately, they also experience a lot of issues with ingesting plastic. Here we go. Next. <laughs> and this is a video that I took um, off of the island of Noz up in Shetland. It's of lots and lots of gannets. Um, we're very lucky to have big, big breeding populations of gannets across islands, uh, many islands across the UK. And uh, something I have seen directly, in fact, on this day when we were out filming, um, we actually saw a gannet that was entangled in what looked like fishing line and bits of other bits of plastic hanging off of it. And something that I want you to try when you're at home now, all you need is one of these, an elastic band or a hair tie or similar. And um, imagine if you're a bird, so put up your hand and get your hair tie or your elastic band and actually tie it round your thumb like this and then round your little finger, okay? No, I'm gonna do the other way. I've done that wrong. <laughs> like this. Here we go, round the back. So that's basically meant to show you that's what may be a gannet having a bit of a plastic around its neck. And something just right at home, some of you may have really kind of be double jointed, <laughs> um, but I definitely cannot get that off. And just try and try and imagine what it must be like. Try and get that off if you can. <laughs> you can see me struggling for about 10 minutes. Oh, I, honestly, I've tried this very many times, but it just goes to show you how tricky it may be for um, an animal like a gannet, you can't actually access to get that entanglement off and what that must be like and how that can be um, really a bit of a struggle for animals like these beautiful gannets. Okay, 
So, I'm going to go to our Wales, and I, I, it's going to be a very brief one because already I'm, I'm way over. Um, but this was a curious humpback whale. It's actually a, an Antarctic humpback whale, a subspecies that can be found in these regions, mainly feeding. And funnily enough, they're here to feed on plankton, absolutely. Um, yes, they are filter feeders. These are brilliant, fantastic species, one of my favourites. Um, and unfortunately, one of the main problems for these beautiful creatures is entanglement as well. And like I just showed you with that hair tie, is that uh, these animals are very mobile. They migrate over huge, huge distances. And so they need that movement in their tail with that fluke that they have to travel these big distances, which can prove really, really tricky. Um, oh my gosh, there you go, <laughs> showing you that mobility in that clip. Um, but they need that free movement to be able to, to survive and, and live their lives as humpback whales. Um, I'm just wondering how I'm doing for time. Okay, um, we're actually going to whiz on, um, but I just wanted to show you, this is um, a picture of a baleen of, a, of those humpback whales, or baleen whales, and then you've also got this here, this is a sperm whale, uh, sperm whale tooth, um, and our whales can be divided between our toothed and our baleen whales, and one of the main questions I get all the time is, can whales, you know, die from, from plastic. Baleen whales less so because they, they, of course, they filter feed, so they mainly feed on, on lots and lots of krill. Um, whereas our sperm whales, they will, may ingest plastic bags, they may ingest big items of plastic, um, which will enter their stomachs um, in thinking that they are a food item. So you do see wash-ups of sperm whales because of that ingestion of plastic, but less so with our baleen whales. Okay, we're gonna press on, because we have lots to get through. Um, Okay, duh, 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 duh. so let's talk about some of the plastics that we have. Um, now microplastics, you, I'm hoping you've heard of, they're basically plastics that are less than five millimeters in size. And they have different names, but there's three kind of names I want you to take away from today. I mean, that fact is really, really scary. We've been talking about plankton and the importance of it. Um, but yeah, six times more microplastics than plankton in the ocean in some places. So really, really scary statistics. But I want to break this down into what are microplastics and where can you find them? Well. We have primary microplastics and secondary microplastics. So what is the actual difference between them? So here's a picture between, um, this is a, a secondary microplastic on your left, I'm hoping, and a primary microplastic. One looks like those tiny plastic pellets, and the other one, that picture in the ocean, is where bigger bits of plastic have broken down into smaller and smaller parts. Um, I'm sure you're all very aware of this already. And this is also a type of microplastic, but it's different because with the picture of those plastic pellets, they're called nurdles. And these nurdles have been made, manufactured to already be a plastic that is micro size, so less than five millimeters. And this happens in factories on a large, large scale. And this is largely because, let me move this over here, this is largely because these noodles make up so much of our plastics in our world that we use. You know, we use it for um, medicine, we use it for bottles, we use it for this table. <laughs> we use these noodles to melt down, to make bigger objects um, all over the world in, in many different ways. But this is the process that they go through and throughout the process of being made as they get um, converted from oil, from crude oil into the factories to make plastic items, they then get spilled in transit and um, as they're moved from place to place, from factory to factory, from country to country all over the world. And so actually Sometimes there can be billions of these noodles entering our oceans or our environment every year by this, this spilling of them into our environment. So it's a, it's a really kind of scary um, thought that there are so many of these tiny microplastics already starting their lives entering our ocean. Okay, we've got another five minutes I'm being told and then we're gonna to get to um, some questions from you guys. So please make sure, I can see you writing some fantastic stuff on there, but make sure you get your questions in um, to me. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. You guys have been fantastic. Um, so we're going to press on. So I've got five minutes. I could do this all day. <laughs> um, one of the things you get, you get told all the time, and you absolutely should, is this fantastic mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle. But what does it mean to recycle? Sometimes people get a bit confused as to what you can and can't recycle. And I'm going to talk about your and our plastic promise at the end here. Um, but it's just something to note is that I always get asked, well, what can I recycle? And there are items which you can't recycle, and how do you know the difference? Well, 
There are different types of plastics, and I'm sure you know that just by seeing and feeling different plastics. Your plastic water bottle may differ very much from your pen, and that's because different properties, different materials of plastic are used for different functions and different uses. Um, so one thing I would like you to look out for is this number that you see on your plastic item. If you're thinking, oh, I need to recycle this, let me check in the packaging if I can recycle it. Check out this number because that number will tell you what kind of plastic it is. Now, you don't need to remember all these. Just have a quick look. There's seven different plastics and they will each have their number, one to seven. And there's some pictures just alongside here showing you what those different plastics may be. So some, for example, polyethylene terafoot. <laughs> that's our plastic water bottles which differ from our polystyrene you know polystyrene that you may get your cups in um, they are non-recyclable but you need to check the number to make sure whether they can or can't be recycled because um, there may be parts of that item which are polystyrene and others that are recyclable bits so just check just kind of making it more simple is keep an eye out for those numbers to find out what plastic um, they are and then go and have a look and find out um, an easy way to do it just by if you really want to become a bit of an expert an easy way to kind of sort it um, in your mind and think can I can't I recycle it and try and identify which plastic it is and this can all be found online in fact I'll actually um, send the team here a resource that's really really great one to look at to if you want to download and have handy for when you're trying to recycle or not recycle. But um, these are some of the things you look out for. So look out for the symbol, look out for the number, which will tell you what plastic it is. And then properties of that plastic um, can also help. Is it translucent or opaque? So can you see through it? Or is it kind of one solid black color? Uh, what happens when you bend it? So is it flexible or is it quite hard to, to maneuver? And can you cut through it? And does it float? That's also a property of plastic, which can help you decide what plastic it is and whether it can be recycled or not not and I don't have loads of time but of course um, I've talked about the the environment and how plastic is linked with that but we are ultimately part of this environment too if you think about the obvious food chain we've mentioned food chains at numerous points but um, algae which is eaten by small organisms like krill or plankton um, may end up containing plastic that's in the environment which is then consumed by larger species like fish and I don't know if you eat fish, perhaps you do, but this fish and some of this food actually sometimes ends up entering our body as well. So this is absolutely something that we need to think about um, as well, not just because we love the ocean and we love whales and we love dolphins, but because it has a direct impact on us as well. And we don't really know what that is at this point, whether it's harmful um, or not, but it's just something to think about and another reason to do something about it and stay optimistic about actually making a positive impact to reduce the amount of plastic that we have. Um, okay, we're going to have a very, very quick ocean quiz time and then um, we've got a great fact coming in from Libby. Do you know by 2050 there'll be more plastic than fish in the ocean? Yes, I've read that. It's a really hard, hard um, uh, facts to listen to but quickly um, and then we're going to have questions after that but I'd like to do a quick ocean quiz so this is what you're going to hear I know it's, it's awful and cheesy I'm so sorry um, so okay in between each round that's what we're going to play when we reveal the answer so very quickly and then we'll get some of your questions answered how much of the earth's surface is covered by oceans I've already said it is it 20% is it 50% or is it 70% please write your answers right now let me know I want to hear from you you guys have been so great until now 70 70 70 what is it Oh, here we go. Hang on. It's 70. Do, do, do. <laughs> okay, uh, enough about that. Okay, moving on. How long have turtles been on the earth? Is it 250 million years? Is it 2 million years or 2,000 years? Um, well done, Libby. Well done, Matthew. Well done, Anna. Okay, have a guess, have a guess, have a guess. 215 million years, 2,000 years, 215 million years. What's the answer? 215 million years! Congratulations! Okay, enough of that, we're gonna move on. And um, what giant jellyfish species, I should have put in there, did I dive with? Was it a barrel jellyfish? Was it a moon jellyfish? Or was it a comb jellyfish? What is it? 
Tell me. Oh, you guys, you guys are too pro. You are fantastic. I've got to say, that is brilliant. <laughs> Oh my gosh, okay, we've, we've kind of done a whistle-stop tour. Um, I would just like to quickly finish um, <laughs> by saying a massive thank you all for tuning in. We'll get some of your questions answered, but before I do, um, ways that you can, you can help and ways that you can get involved with, I'm hoping you are all, you seem to be completely savvy on this already, um, but little swaps that you can actually change um, day to day to help with the issue. Swap that plastic bottle for a reusable one. Um, you know, we have so much plastic in the environment already we need to actually just stop producing it and um, swap cling film for beeswax and um, wrapping which is a which is a really re great reusable wrapping that I use for my sandwiches regularly um, and we use so much cling film in the world it's a small item and um, you don't really think of but um, yeah one that we absolutely just need to say no to of course straws is a big one and um, make sure you either say paper straw please, or just no straw at all, which can stop that demand for plastic straws. Um, I've seen a few balloon wreaths recently, why not just blow some bubbles instead? It's a really great alternative and will stop you know, those balloons entering our oceans and being really harmful for those animals like our turtles. And this is one I just wanted to quickly talk about um, because I've been watching the lovely garden birds since I've been in lockdown and some have had plastic in their nests. A great way of helping is leaving out a little bit of your hair. From a hairbrush in a tree at the beginning when um, spring was in full swing these birds were out collecting feathers and materials for nests so if you leave out a bit of hair it can actually help and will stop them looking and picking up um plastic hopefully okay right i'm so glad you've all enjoyed it we've got some lovely people matthew saying cool i'm glad you think so oh claire's a beekeeper fantastic oh emma's loved this lesson that's really really great um okay so can we get some of your questions on here i'm going to make this big so i can see some of your questions coming in the team um let's have a look uh doo -doo -doo. Shall I scroll back up, team, for some of the... There's a great question. El um, Eleanor has asked, Lizzie, what difference do we make when reducing our use of plastic when it seems the worst culprits are big industries? That is great fantastic. Question, yeah, that is a really good question. And I'm, I think one of the best things about... Um, you know there's so many of us on this planet and lots of small changes that may feel insignificant at the time but lots of small changes ultimately make a big global difference and it may be you head out for a weekly beach clean a monthly beach clean but that plastic has then been removed from that environment you're absolutely right we need to see change um up through the 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 chains if you like you know government and we need to see businesses stepping up uh, as well but your difference will still make a really really big difference and it may feel like you know you've just gone out and done a small part but it's lots of people doing um small things um is a lot more important than than one person um doing one one big thing if you like because there are so many of us that can make that small difference and make that big positive impact so um yeah i'd highly encourage you to 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 go for it stay optimistic your your bit will definitely make a difference Leslie or Lizzie, the next question is from Leslie. What is your favourite land animal? Oh, that is a good question. My favourite land animal is oh, it's bad. I'm going to say it. It's um has to be an African elephant, just because that's what I'm focusing on for my research now. Um, they are incredible. The largest land mammal on earth. They're a beautiful species. Very charismatic. Very intelligent. Um, and yeah, the African elephant. <laughs> And to follow on from that, Nicola has asked, what's your favourite sea creature? I know it might be hard to choose just one, Lizzie, but what's your favourite sea creature? <laughs> favourite sea creature. Okay. Um, do you know, one that I've, I've really kind of found fascinating recently are the nudibranchs, so our sea slugs, just because there's huge, huge variety in what they look like. They're very, very colourful. Um, you can find them if you go, you know, diving and looking amongst um, perhaps seaweed, especially off of, of Wales, and I'm sure Northern Ireland too. In fact, there's a place, there's a marine conservation zone in that Irish sea stretch that I showed you in that picture earlier, that's really well known for nudibranchs, and it's got really great places for those important habitats like seaweed and and small corals so yeah nudibranchs if you don't know what they are have a look online they're a fantastic group of sea slugs <laughs> i'm so bright i'm just going to shut this there we are 
Lizzie, Sam has asked, how did you become interested in marine environment and especially microplastics? Great question. Um, yeah, so I, I have always, I love the ocean and just spending time in the ocean has been, has played a huge part of of my interest and fascination and uh, in it. So, I mean, I've always, my family, we, we go out to the coast of Pembrokeshire and spend time in the ocean or near it and exploring the coast. And I still do now. And it's just, the more I spend, um, the more time I spend around these environments, the more precious they are, if you like. And of course, the unfortunate side to that is that you do see microplastics in these environments. So all of a sudden you want to know more about what is the impact of this and and how common are they and unfortunately there are microplastics across all of our beaches so again if you want to make that difference you know if you're out on a beach just why not do a two minute beach clean super easy way to, to to keep your beach clean and take those microplastics out of that environment and keep it looking fantastic and on the back of that this is another brilliant question talking about you know beach combing and keeping our shores clean now, yeah i'd like to know what part of the ocean is most polluted mm. so um you may have heard of the the five gyres um they're like these big areas of the ocean where essentially the huge currents bringing and it's kind of called this plastic soup um you will have seen various different names for it and i think the, the biggest one is out in the pacific um these these gyres in our oceans are where these currents mix up and it's essentially creating an area where all this plastic in our environment from all parts of the world come together and create this big swirling of plastics if you were to go there you wouldn't see you know a massive you know plastic bag and a plastic bottle because it's all broken down into smaller and smaller bits um however you know to, to our human eye because of how the currents work you, you may be like this has got a higher concentration of plastic but in terms of what part of the ocean has the most it's quite hard to know especially as we have yet to explore um especially uh, the, the deeper areas of our ocean so um who knows you know the, the mariana trench um you may have all heard of the deepest part of the ocean 11 kilometers down um hardly explored i wonder how much plastic it is down there so can't say for sure but if you if you are kind of looking to really understand what happens when our plastic breaks down and travels across all these connected oceans have a look at the the gyres that we have lizzie just before the next question just a shout out to claire mcanini i think it is she's saying her daughter's nine years old and is in a bee she's a beekeeper which is fantastic oh, so, yeah oh, <laughs> oh well done that is that is really brilliant funny enough this morning i was um there's a a, a, a bee um hello honey bees have moved into a local ash tree um oh. absolutely love these important pollinators so well done that is awesome well done claire and we'll probably take one final question yeah. this is from my namesake claire and claire has asked like liz you've talked about your travels and your recent time in antarctica but have you been to the coral reef in australia the great barrier Great Barrier Coral Reef, yep. Yes, yeah, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, no, um, I, I haven't actually. I mean, I've, I have been to Australia, um, but haven't spent much time in the ocean um, the, around there. No, I would absolutely, absolutely love to. It's, it's almost like the, the, poster, the poster child of, the, uh, of all the coral reef systems that we have on our planet, you know, the largest one, um, obviously being the Great Barrier, but we he here, even in the UK and around our waters um, and Northern Ireland have some wonderful corals. So, you know, it's so easy to, especially as I've listed so many places that I've been to, it's so easy. <laughs> Ian says, Google says, Hector's dolphin is the smallest and the rarest. There we are. Um, gosh, I should have known that. I've actually seen Hector's off of New Zealand. So, fool me. I'm so sorry. Um, but yes, the, um, I was just going to say, it's so easy to jump on kind of all these different places across the world. But I think especially as we're all in lockdown, one thing that we've learned is that, um, yeah, exploring the nature on your doorstep is so important and, and valuing that and seeing how incredible it is. And we're very lucky to have the wildlife that we do here. So I would recommend exploring what's on our doorstep first, definitely. Great. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Um, should we do the plastic promise? Have you got your wee slide there? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this is a great one. Um, 
I don't know if you can still see my screen, but this, yeah. this slide is all very relevant. Um, and I'd say my plastic promise is, is um, I try and do a, a regular beach clean. And actually, whenever I'm out and about, I will, if I'm not, if I'm not, you know, uh, running around, then I will take a bag and I will make sure that I pick up plastic. If I see plastic, I will pick it up. Sometimes you, you can't, otherwise you'll end up coming back with a, <laughs> a bag big, bigger than you. But just, I guess, um, in, when you're heading out, if you're going into the environment, take, take an extra bag in, into a woodland or on the beach, whatever it is, take that bag and, and maybe do a two minute cleanup. Um, and that's my that's my plastic promise and has been for a while and I will continue to do that as well as keeping on top of what can be recycled and what can't. So, um, yeah, I would recommend everyone to watch um, who's watching to go to that link that's on the slide here and um, let me know what your plastic promise is and make sure you, you submit it as well. It's really important. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lizzie. That was so interesting and really, really inspiring. So thanks so much for jumping on with us today. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all the participants for getting involved. That was really, really good. Please sign, add your plastic promise and look out in our Eco Schools NI Facebook page for more webinars coming up like this. So thanks very much, everybody.